The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Morningstar IM, ABN 54071808501, AFSL 228986, and Alfinity Investment Management, ABN 12140833709, AFSL 356895, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. How are you now and welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director of Barclay PS Capital's Wealth Management Team and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but that are actually working to be in the right things at the right time, the right weight for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our absolute best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform. All information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Morningstar Investment Management Australia is delighted to be sponsoring Ensemble's investment podcast series designed to equip advisors to have more meaningful conversations with clients. Morningstar Investment Management is a global leader in asset allocation, investment research and portfolio construction. Specialising in investing, behavioural coaching and practice optimization. Morningstar strives to give advisors the tools to confidently navigate their clients' complex needs. Morningstar, empowering investor success. Alfinity is a specialist active fund manager of Australian and global equity funds, strongly aligned with our clients' objectives. Our aim is to deliver consistent outperformance through different market cycles by investing in quality, undervalued companies with underestimated forward earnings expectations. Our experienced teams of co-portfolio managers identify these companies using a truly unique partnership between detailed analyst-driven fundamental research, ESG integration, and specific targeted quantitative inputs. How are you now? And welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast, brought to you by Morningstar. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director, Barclay Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Team, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but also that work and maybe try and find the right time to be the right weight for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform and obviously all information contained is general in nature. Here we go. Now we've seen it in company presentations, we've seen it talked about, we've seen it in movies, we've seen it in the news, we've seen it beaten to death at every finance conference between here and Helsinki that I've happened to go through in the last couple of years. Occasionally, God forbid, We've seen it actually utilized by companies and utilized by advisors and utilized by the industry to to achieve some sort of efficiency, uh, or at least we have been told that that is the case. The growth of artificial intelligence, someone had to say it, in development and adoption has not only been rapid, but has been uh, uh, tagged as being the tip of the iceberg. We need to go further into how to separate the wheat from the chaff, one of my favorite expressions how to use AI in the investment process and potentially how to know which companies potentially are making the most of it and maybe build up a bit of an investment case for some of these areas. I am joined by some pretty smart heads in this particular space. Trent Masters, who is the Global Portfolio Manager of Alfinity Investment Management and Bianca Rose of Morningstar. Great intro, if you could hear that background. Hello. (laughs) (laughs) Brought to you. Brought to you by Oscar Piastri and the McLaren Formula One too. Um, and we've got Bianca Rose of Morningstar, who's a portfolio manager there. Uh, a bit of background noise kicking in. I hope Kira's cl- cleaning that up for us, so it should be okay. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us. How are you now? Yeah, great. Thanks yeah, thanks for having me. me. Um, everyone gets the same question. Bianca, you've been here before, um, so we'll be quick with you to, to get into it in just a second. But Trent, thank you for joining us. Uh, first off, everyone gets the same question. What do you do? How do you make money? Yeah, no, thanks. I'm a portfolio manager for the global equities team at Alfinity. So Alfinity, we're a long only manager. It's it's really a an investment process that has some very simple, I guess, quant signals for what we're looking for in terms of stocks. So we're looking for momentum. So for that, we're looking for stocks that are in an earnings upgrade cycle and consistently beating earnings expectations. There's also a very strong quality overlay. So those companies that are generating strong ROEs, improving ROEs, generating cash off the balance sheet. And then, of course, that third leg, very important in any situation, is a reasonable valuation. And there's a range of metrics, including our own DCFs that we do to, to validate that. So they're the three key elements that come together to basically define what an Alfinity stock looks like. And when you're looking at four to 5,000 potential global equities, that's a way to distill down the universe 
into a subset of companies that you think will be operating with the wind at their back and have success over time? Well, I think that's fascinating, especially with regards to the quant side of things and how we can and talk about AI. We'll get to that in just a moment as we go on through the podcast as well. Bianca, welcome back. Good to see you again. Thank you. Um, anything changed down at Morningstar? What's happening? What do you do? <laughs> Introduce yourself to the people who don't. <laughs> sure. Uh, so I'm a multi-asset investor and we use valuation-driven um, uh, framework to pick our investments and so we pretty much go anywhere. So, you know, um, so we will go in equities, alternatives, fixed income and so obviously um, AI is a very interesting area at the moment. Um, now, with regards specifically to AI, I'm, I'm going to throw this over to the both of you. I've got, I've got the, good that I've got you both here. AI moving as it is going to without specific details on dates or anything like that. But we have recently seen a note from, from Goldman Sachs who, who, who is saying that maybe it's all a little bit overblown with regards to the expense and the expenditure that's being put into AI. I believe that what they said is something like uh, that it's a trillion dollar spend, but there was no trillion dollar solution that it's going to solve. I find that a little bit simplistic. Your take on, on exactly how far it's, it's impacted the market, specifically with the, 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 the listed investment markets? Anyone? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to take that. If, or or yeah. answer a question. I, I think if it's <laughs> trying to quantify is it a trillion dollars or so, I think that my sense from talking to, you know, for managers that we also employ as well as our own work is that it's hard to say what that market is yet. And I think um, as well with all the costs that have been kind of spent, you know, particularly by what we'll talk about this more later, the hyperscalers and, and so on. But, um, you know, they're spending a lot of CapEx, but it's really hard to say yet, like, because they're still seeing benefits. So it's kind of like we're still in that payoff stage. Yeah. Hmm. Look, I, I think in terms of the overarching technology, so I'm the portfolio manager that covers technology at Alfinity. And normally when people talk about that next transformative tech breakthrough, I'm normally very skeptical. Yep. So two to three years ago, people were talking about, you know, metaverse and Web3 and crypto and you're sitting in these VC panels and to be honest, my eyes were glazing over because I couldn't really see a really tangible commercial use case. I think at a very high level, AI is fundamentally different. So I do think it does have exceptional legs in terms of how it can transform, how businesses operate, how services are delivered, the efficiency gains that roll through the economy. In terms of how that translates down into listed stocks, I'm sure everyone's fairly familiar with the hyper gu- the Gartner hype cycle, where you do always have this this very kind of excited froth that can move their way into stocks when you have this initial dis- dislocation before the market does start to settle and you do start to have those clear winners that emerge. In terms of where we're at for AI, I think the really interesting comparison is to have a look at what happened in that internet age, where to begin with, you had the enablers. Then you had the infrastructure and then you had the software and services businesses that emerged probably about two to three years after the technology was put in place. Mm -hmm. And the internet gave rise to companies like Amazon, like Google, created that beautiful platform where they could get access to hundreds of millions of billions of customers. I think with AI, we are moving into that second piece now in terms of the infrastructure, but in terms of the winners in terms of software and services, I still think that is up for debate because there is as much risk of disruption as what there is opportunities to apply the technology. So overall, very excited, but it will be a volatile space until you get those clear winners emerge. Yeah, that's right. So we've seen, like you said, we've seen the enablers, so the developers, let's just say in in, in that side, which has created things like ChatGPT, um, you know, obviously the most talked about thing in the last last year and a half. So what now we're moving on to the adopters and who can actually help it to increase margins and, and increase efficiencies. Is there any other, are you seeing any main standouts in, in any areas where that yeah, that is? I, I think in terms of that early manifestation in terms of earnings, so obviously you've seen it in your, you know, in your NVIDIAs and your, your other semi-stocks. Mm. In terms of using it for an application, I, I think that is where the market is getting probably a little bit impatient at the moment because you are having all this spend and people want to see the revenue and the returns that sit behind it. But there's always a maturity curve in terms of technology. So expecting to have the killer app emerge already is almost like expecting a baby to walk out of the womb. Like it'll take some time for that to emerge. Now, we are seeing some early applications, so Microsoft 365 AI co-pilots. Yeah, let's talk about this. Anything on that? Go go ahead, Trent. So so again with that, like, so we use it internally. And look, to be honest at the moment, I, I don't think it is at that level where you would push it out. You'll have a bit of a test cohort within a business. I don't think it's good enough yet to push out to the tens of thousands of employees across a whole organization. But at the same time, I have no doubt that in 12 to 24 months, it will get there. So it's just around that adoption curve where there's that 
a little bit of impatience now where people want to see the returns right now, but the technology has really only emerged in terms of generative AI in the last 18 months. And it will take time to mature and hit that point where people go, look, there's real value here and I'm really happy to start paying for it. Yeah. Bianca, how are you seeing uh, people using AI in your space? Uh, So specifically, I guess within Morningstar, we're even using it like within like analyst work and stuff. We're even doing surveys with that you know, chat GPT is one survey. Details, survey. details, tell us. So we might, yeah. you know, say, okay, so the team, what do you think about the outlook for um, where's our next best idea? And we might just put into chat GPT to throw some wacky yeah. stuff out. Yeah. Just to, you know, but I think also just um, getting um, thoughts on, um, you know, if we're looking out. Because typically when we're doing research, we might be Googling. So instead of now Googling mm. stuff, we're just using chat PT to yeah. kind of collate the results. Now I will say, to sort of transport, there's some stuff that kind of comes through that we go, oh, it's rubbish. And we, but we kind of know what's rubbish and what's not. But so we kind of have to sort of weed through it. But it's kind of cool and interesting that you can collate stuff in a really quick fashion. Um, probably the other areas that we've used it specifically within Morningstar as a corporate level is we've created something called Morningstar Mo, which is like a, a chat bot. Oh, yeah. Where we've created all this Morningstar database. Now we've got manager research, equity research, you know, all these data points, and it just takes all that data and, you know, advisors can ask queries of it and it just sort of brings all that database, you know, data points together. So, as, as, so as an advisor, when I'm actually trying to compile a, a statement of advice, for example, for a client, this is, might not, for, for the, uh, sorry, sorry, Chair, for the wholesale fund managing sort of side of things, this might not be exactly an that, but, but my eyes light up with something like this when, um, when so if, if if I'm creating a statement of advice or, or an advice piece for a client, um, that would actually be quite helpful. Being it could able be to really helpful. Season. I mean, I'm even seeing it with fund managers; they're using it for RFP. Yes, and that's all right. Those sorts of things. So definitely, you can use that sort of stuff in yeah. Pfizer loan for you know SAAs and 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 the like. So a lot of um, so some fund managers I know actually have got um, AI specialists not on the investing side. I'm talking like just internally. Um, where they're using it for cost savings, but then also tapping in with the analyst team on, okay, like what's the investing insights, but RFPs, all that, um, kind of client servicing work that kind of maybe, and even, um, executive assistants, like, you know, it used to be like just the CEO could have, now you kind of can use, you know, they, I still have yet to, I, you know, tools to kind of help. I, I, I have not yet gotten used to the role that I'm in of, that and I still depend on other people and I depend on myself doing it a lot too and I get yelled at by my own people for that, okay. taking on too much myself. Um, now, from the fun side of things, how is the um, – um, because you're quant. Uh, oh, so we, you, you have quant elements, sorry. Yeah, we have, we're the quant elements. So the quant gives us a signal where to look, but then we do have to do the fundamental research to validate. So it's more that, you know, these are the subset of stocks. That could be three. interesting. More, yeah. of a, more of a screen, more to kind of direct that you're making sure that what you actually own is in process. That's a really powerful piece. And then you have to do the bottom up fundamental pro- fundamental work to actually backfill. Is this a good investment or not? So that's, it is. It, it's a healthy combination of the two. That's fine. Well, aside from Copilot, have you seen have you have you seen AI come into the fund management space much at all? Yeah. Look, I think I find that in terms of the use of it, I find it just creeps in terms of my everyday use. So if you are trying to get up the curve very quickly in terms of a stock that you haven't looked at before in industry. I do find that you can punch it into something like a perplexity and you can get a very, very succinct summary and overview and then you can dig into things in a whole lot more detail. There's some emerging AI applications that can just trawl through any, I guess, um, you know, company transcript and, you know, look for themes, identify, you know, a bit more of a summary more succinctly and quickly than what you could ordinarily. So that, that's even coming through some of your broad-based applications like, like FactSet, those AI summaries, which is quite handy. Yep. And so, yeah, I do find that it is just creeping in terms of its application. In terms of what um, Bianca was talking about before, I think the real power in terms of AI, so you can train the model, but the quality of what comes out is all about the data that it's trained on. And that's why you're moving to this retrieval augmented generation where you take the model and point it at a trusted data source, one of your internal data sources, to really surface that information effectively and make sure that what's coming out you can actually trust in terms of output. So you you already know that your data source is good, and so that's where it's from, yeah. as opposed to to Google pulling it out of yeah. Reddit. Because the whole the whole like you know argument about hallucination, like it, always in tech, you've got to use a fancy word to describe something that's incredibly simple. Hallucination yeah. is just a model just throwing up crap. 
Okay. And it's probably throwing up crap because the data that's been trained on hasn't been broad enough or the quality of the underlying information hasn't been to a level that you can actually trust the outputs. And as the models develop, as the quality of that information that's fed into it develops, the models will get a whole lot more accurate and a lot more usable. Which I think the best example of that is Google and Reddit having that tie up and, and, and Reddit responses coming out through Google, uh, the, the Google search results. Yeah. And I think you have seen Google start to move away from that. That, that one a little felt bit, yeah. a bit unusual to me in terms of a tie up. I can understand with some of the news organizations and that being a bit of a cleaner data source, but yeah, Reddit could be useful in terms of breadth, but I think that underlying quality, you might have to do a bit more of an overlay on. Well, as I mean, it's, it's like any set. I mean, you're already as good as the data that you're using. I think that we've established that. Yeah. Um, okay. So we've talked about that. I'm going through the questions that advisors have put into the ensemble platform here, which is which is great. We've got a couple of good minds that we can pick on uh, on some of these questions that we've that we have. So, uh, I've got how has AI impacted companies that were early adopters? We've talked about that more or less. We can get back around to that as well. Where do opportunities for AI exist outside of the uh, of the initial side of things? Now, myself, I'd be talking about data centers immediately. Do, do you see any any places like that 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 look right for? Uh, Maybe not for disruption, but for, for being able to utilize the, the growth in AI. Yeah, look, that, that's been one of the next major legs that people have been looking at. So it's been data centers and then more importantly, the energy that can feed data centers. Yes. So we did a fairly detailed piece of work around data centers. And what go, we found go, that go. Yeah. even though there was the inflection in terms of the activity, we just couldn't make sense of the financial metrics that were coming out of the data centers. Really? So it felt like one that was more, I guess, narrative over numbers in terms of the investment opportunity. I think the next real leg will come in terms of those end applications. And I, I think they will come. I'm, you mean the software stage? Yeah, the yeah. software stage. Like even in going to that, what, what, what's, uh, what are we talking so about? So at the moment, we're just at that infrastructure building out, yeah. as Trent's talked about. So we're just with the semiconductor chips. We've got to get that kind of – and then to really expand into like AI software applications and all of that, that's kind of when – you're going to really get that rampage up. Yeah. And that's probably where the data centers will come in. Like, But at the moment, it's it's early day. Thing. Very early. It's not happening. So I'll, I'll give you two recent examples just over the last two weeks, just in, in personal life. So first of all, we had an IT issue. We have outsourced IT. And so you put the issue into um, perplexity and it actually threw up the answer in terms of how I could retrieve this file without having to go to the back office. Wow. So you just you just think about the application of that in terms of not just... IT servicing, but also customer service. Like the quality was actually there. It actually gave me the the legitimate answer. The other one was like anyone in Sydney, I have two young kids and one of them was quite sick about a month ago. Of course, you don't purely rely on Dr. Google. You always do the verification with the GP, but I typed it into perplexity. These are the symptoms. And I said, look, she's probably got a, a virus, probably a flu, but if this emerges she might have scarlet fever. Oh, great. And so I got that out and I thought, man, like, this model has been trained on too many Emily Bronte novels. Yeah. Scarlet fever, like what the hell? Yeah. Turns out two days later she gets the rash and it actually was scarlet fever. Get out of so, here. I oh, know. So that, that's when I just went, wow. Like, this thing, I did, when I first got the information, I thought it was completely off base. It was actually leading in terms of what it could potentially be. And so you just have that application just rolled out across the entire medical community. Right? Yeah. You, could, you could upskill every basic GP to have the absolute latest trends in terms of, you know, disease states, what the different symptoms mean, like just the power of that across the entire medical construct could be just Which is actually already used, right? right? Like often I go see the doctor and they'll and typing it in. Typing it in. Yeah, there's and checking you see, in. They bring it up and you're like, well, that's all this. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously <laughs> they gotta interpret it, right? Again, to my point about you know, us in financial world, we're getting data that we are oh, that's you know, but you gotta interpret it. Yeah. You know? Um but Definitely in that healthcare space and medical trials now, stuff that might have taken years is can like you can get you know results pretty quickly. Yep. Yeah. On um, so that I'd say financial companies as well, which yeah. have got a lot of data, like financial data. Yes. Can use AI for that. Um, so there's a lot of um, and we're already seeing it with like chatbots and you know things mm. like that. The, the but chatbots that actually work. Up until now, yes. chatbots have yes. been so frustrating that you just yes. end up. Well, yes. you're arguing with a machine, but it feels like yes. they're getting to a point as they can. Yeah. At, at least, at least they say that it's a chatbot now, as opposed to or like like you, you're praying. Oh, you're, you're praying that it's someone in Malaysia. You were talking to someone. <laughs> yeah, but I, please, yeah. just I, I want to go in Hyderabad. Who knows what's going on here? That he could just tell me what's going on. I don't care where he is. Don't care what his name is. Yeah. I hope he's getting paid well. Just help me like this. If it comes up and says it's a chatbot. I'm just going to go through the motions until I can talk to someone else right now. Until because it's, it's it's going to get there. Though. But I think it's getting there because I exactly agree. Like yeah. you know, a couple of years ago, I'd be so frustrated. Now I can kind of go, all right. About seventy percent of the time, if my 
you know, if my question's pretty simple, yeah. it can be solved. Yes. The chatbot. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, like, you know, healthcare and also, you know, when we think of doctors, how many times do they get it wrong? Well, now they can, you know, kind of, well, you think of airplanes and stuff, they've got black box. Yep. So you kind of, you know, they've talked about this in books, but medical profession, it, it's nice that you've got something to kind of cross check. Something to go back to. Yeah, that, that is true. Uh, are we seeing anything generational? This isn't actually on my list, but I was about to, to just talk about the generational, the generational A, the generational trust and discourse that you have with the, the new generations coming through with regards to, to, to fund advice and, and portfolio, not only performance, but what you're doing, what you're investing in, how you're advertising it and the content with Morningstar, with the way that, that, that advisors are going to need. I found that there was a huge dispersion between the older generation that I need to be providing advice to and the newer guys and how they actually want it, how they take things in. Um, for the old, I mean, sometimes there's a difference, but for the most part, the older guys that want you to talk through and walk through the things and bits and pieces that you want, the younger people would be just like, can you just give this to me in, I just need a 30 second sort of, put it even as a video. Mm-hmm. And so what I used to do is just take, I, I would actually just go, okay, this is the, 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 this is the scenario that's going on in this part of the market right now. I'd take it out of, the, this is actually what I would do. You ready? I'd take it out of the financial times. I'd put it through chat GPT. I'd say, rewrite this. So I'm not copywriting anything like that. Rewrite this particular scenario into, uh, into a 30 second, um, voice thing. I then take that. I put that into a different AI scenario. I'd say, make a video, 30 second video out of this one with the features and, 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 and photos into it. I'd have some photos that would be selected there that I'd want to use as well that I'd cut out and it would create a nice little one minute piece. I could then go out to my clients and say, this is this complex scenario that's going on over here in say Japan with the yen or it's going on in in Russia or or with regards to gas or why fertilizer prices are going through the roof. This is an explainer for you that's going on. This is a lot easier than me going and calling every single person and definitely a lot easier than me writing a whole piece or even just cut and pasting something out of the financial times. Mm. Yeah, I would say it's not something we do like in terms of personalizing our content for different like, you know, um, I guess user groups. But what to your point though about maybe taking the data I've used it with our marketing team for presentation back. Yep. So I might say, Hey, I want you to create me this sort of a, you know, picture with this and this and this and then they'll just go away and instead of in the past where they would have actually literally mocked it up, they've put it into AI and then they said, Here's five different images and I go like out of those five, th- these three are not on the money. These two are pretty good. Yeah. And then they'll work off that. So we are using it in, in marketing documents and so on for pitches and to kind of convey stories, but we're not at the stage where we'd probably tailor it to different audience groups. Yeah. We, oh, we, we, we'd, we'd be the same. A, a lot of our clients are, are Insto clients, so that t- it tends to be around a, a particular structure around – you know, how the fund operates, making sure you're true to process and, and doing what you actually say as mm-hmm. opposed to the – the, the more news focused pieces. Yeah. yeah. Now, are, are we seeing are we seeing any increased risk in privacy going on at the moment? Uh, it's 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 just been flagged here as a question that's come in from one of the advisors. This going are the are the companies that we're seeing? So we're seeing so much dependence being put on data centers. We're seeing a a a, a growing amount of data that's being held in a smaller number of cloud companies. Mm-hmm. Azure, Google Clouds, and AWS. And AWS yeah. uh, are the three big ones that come to mind. Is are we seeing now, not to put a, a, a date on it, but a significant global shutdown happened because of one company and we're seeing just how much emphasis could be put on. Uh, I mean, on potentially, the- right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll just say, look, when we created Mo within Morningstar, people putting their advisory questions in, we kind of deal with Microsoft because we partnered with Microsoft to fast track it where they had to clean out the questions so yeah. that like it couldn't like have cookies of, you and know. And you have to know that they're cleaned out. And be yeah, sure so sure there was out. kind of certain... Um, I guess, contracts put in place to kind of – but it is a really new area and I think we're going to see, you know, regulation and all sorts of things once this kind of evolves. But at the moment, they can't regulate what they don't know is kind of going to grow to. Yeah. And it is is a bit of a two-way street as well. So, you know, Bianca's right that for a lot of the times – particularly when it comes to training the AI models, a lot of the companies will stipulate that we retain the data and it doesn't go elsewhere. And you even go as far as the the Apple approach where they're going to have their own internal... Ecosystem. Yeah, they're going to have their own ecosystem. They're going to have their own data centers and they're going to try and satisfy most of the queries for their clients just purely based on their own as opposed to having to go out to, to a third party. Yep. There's also, I guess, a bit of a privacy concern in terms of 
what you put into the model. So you put a query into a model and then it'll use that to help train. And so companies are now putting in place policies in terms of your use of the AI models, yep. you know, what, what you can actually put in and making sure that you aren't actually allowing proprietary data to to slip through. <laughs> and so we've got we've got an ESG team that are that are quite phenomenal and they did a whole piece with the CSIRO looking at what are the best benchmarks and what are the best policies that you need when talking to companies regarding the use of AI. Really? Do you so want to go into that? Privacy. Oh, look, it was just, it was a joint venture that they formed, joint project probably about oh, 18 months ago before ChatGPT even really emerged. And it was just a way to approach with companies, what are the questions that you need to run through, what governance structures you like to see in place with the companies that you are moving into, just to make sure they have got their arms around AI and they're not exposing themselves or their customers to too much risk. I like that term, arms around it. And then you've got outright rebellion, which I've heard, and I won't mention who this particular person was because they're they're close to me, but... They lead a team and it's come down from head office, quite a large, uh, a, a company that you would know at a large scale. And it's come down from head office to say that we, we want to see an increase in, in use in the, GP, in the in the chat function that we've built internally. It probably just runs off something else. We want to see an increase in it. And this person has flat out said to their team that use it once per day, but no more. Because what is going to happen is that they're afraid that, that the more it gets used, the more it will learn and then it's, it's going to replace one or two people on that team. So it's just it's it's interesting to see the way that every now and then it's just like comrades, we're gonna fight this machine that's going on here and nobody uses it. Use enough so that it's being used, but don't use it at the at the amount that they that they say once it's being used. Yeah. Interesting. But, but at the same time, it's always hard to hold back the tide. <laughs> like you can see these evolutions coming and I I completely understand the concerns around job losses because one of the main, I think, financial benefits that will flow in the end from AI are the efficiencies. And, yep. you know, efficiency is just a, a, a dirty word sometimes for, for job losses. So, yeah, go on. But, but you have a look at, this isn't the first time we've had this kind of tech dislocation. Like, you know, we've had the industrial age. We've oh, had, back to, yeah. we've, we've had the internet emerge. And every time we've had these discussions of it's going to wipe out like such massive swathes of the employed um, population and there's going to be mass unemployment. But then you, you tend to find over time that employment markets just reshape and create other areas of demand. So, you know, here we are now after two already like massive employment dislocations over the last, you know, say 100 years. And we're sitting here in most developed markets with an unemployment rate that starts with a three. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I do think, and I, I can understand why the, why the fear would emerge, but you tend to find that those employment markets do re- reshape and create opportunities for those jobs that do get dislodged. I, I think it is as well. While we're talking about efficiencies, we will, because we're, we're, we're actually now up to the investing in AI side. We sort of, we started with this and we're going to finish off with this one as well. That what, uh, if you listen to company reports or company presentations, or if you listen to the way that companies are speaking, is there anything that's standing out with regards to how they're adopting or using AI? Because it, it sort of, it happened all of a sudden when nobody was talking about AI in their company presentations or, or in their, um, you know, the earnings call that comes afterwards. And then all of a sudden the numbers, because I always like to read the numbers of times this was mentioned in, a, in an earnings call. All of a sudden, artificial intelligence just rose to, to yes, it's being used 70 times in the earnings call. Mm. Um, is there anything specifically that you're looking at with how they're using it and how they're adopting it to see if, there, if it builds an investment case a bit better and how can maybe some advisors be able to, 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 to piggyback off that? Yeah, look, you are right in terms of the mentioning. And I think sometimes companies did themselves a bit of a disservice by mentioning it so often because then you take the ramp in terms of the share price. And all it does is put a target on your back for if you can't actually generate. Ah, you're revenue. doing it. Yeah, <laughs> but, kick it, kick it down. Somebody else's problem next. Yeah, yeah. but you, I kind of break that AI opportunity into two legs. So first of all, the revenue leg, and that that will take a little bit longer for most companies for it to come through. But even I normally go to the US three or four times a year, and I've even found just a, a, a subtle change in the language from companies that I talk to about using it for internal efficiencies. So, you know, back back in my trip in March and even last September. Companies were talking about we're flattening our hiring expectations based on the application of internal AI. Okay. Last time I was there in May, June, you could start to hear that language change towards we are actually taking out some some heads. Oh, really? So it, it does feel like that that maturity in terms of the curve is getting to the point that they are looking at actually reducing workforces as opposed to just flattening hiring intentions. Okay. And then, of course, everyone's just racing, just trying to build that new application that can actually generate that revenue side rather than just the cost efficiency side. Yeah. Is do you think that socially companies that adopt it too much with regards to reducing headcount are going to get any blowback? I know that we've been I maybe it maybe, depends on the regional location. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to say like certain countries are known for you know in Europe. Yeah, call out Olympic. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> whatever's, whatever's happened to Fres, but they, yeah. they, they, they love standing yeah. up. It's, you know, so there are labour unions, but then there are obviously other markets like the US, which are pretty free, you know, yeah. um, mm-hmm. in, in, the, in, the, in the cap, you know, staff force. Yeah. And there are actually places like Japan, I'm going to say, where they have labour so- shortages. So this is actually a really positive thing because it's actually like they might, you know, say in hospitality, you could have robots delivering, mm-hmm. you know, a dish or something. So it kind of can solve some problems. It's not all about losing. Sometimes actually there are some like shortages around the world. All right. Well, now let's just uh, see if we can talk about anything a bit more specifically with regards to asset class or maybe even allocation weightings, which is sort of the last the last question that I've got here. I think we've done amazingly well getting through these ones. So uh, it's how can advisors ensure their clients have the right exposure to companies who are using AI and capitalize on this exciting new innovation? Whoever put that in, thank you very much. But it's 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 the right exposure to companies utilizing AI is a difficult one to go into. Is 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 there a way to be able to sort of see if you, if I'm just trying to think about how you'd actually sort of formulate that as a, as a conversation? The so maybe in terms of frameworks and, and alluding to what you were saying earlier, we kind of think about it on the cost savings versus the growth opportunity side because there's like two sides, right? And so I think that, and then factoring in valuation, where do we think valuation may have got a little bit ahead? Of in into the point of hype and, and and so on and so we're trying to use that framework but it is really tricky as well to say who are the winners and losers today because it's you know, it's technology and that's kind of the nature it's rapidly evolving yeah. of who who looks like the winner today may not be the winner tomorrow um and you know it's constantly changing like I think even in the chip space hmm. you know you've got Samsung vying with um Eskahonics and Micron on that memory chip space to get into the NVIDIA, like I'm going to call it little puddle, to kind of uh, get into that profit pool. Yep. And it, and it's not going to stay where it is today. So so we we kind of grapple with the growth and the, the profit margins with the valuation side. That's how we... And talking of the valuation strength, so the, the, the three things that you guys use at Alfinity, you were talking about momentum, ROE, and valuation. So that yep. the valuation, that last one, is there a point... Obviously, the Magnificent Seven that that rallied so hard on the back for, for a fair chunk of it on the back of the AI fad or, or whatever it was going to be used on, sort of yeah. overblown or not. Is there a certain valuation area where you where you just like that's overcooked oh, or look, that's undercooked? Of course. So you're always anchoring it back to to earnings. So you know you've got to have the earnings to back those those valuations or those increases in share prices. Mm-hmm. So that's really important. So if you have a look last year, Nvidia. I think it went up, the, the multiple actually went down because earnings went up so much. But this year, you are getting a bit more of a multiple expansion come through. So you're always keeping an eye on that. I think just going back to the aggregate portfolio construction, look, even though yep. I am incredibly excited and bullish on the long-term future of AI, you've always got to have diversification within the portfolio. So even though I'm quite enthusiastic, our tech weighting within the portfolio is is basically around market You because know, yep. you've always got to have those those other stories in the portfolio those other cycles, those other areas that you're exposed to because you always have to be mindful that these life doesn't happen and investing doesn't happen in a straight line. You will go through periods of froth where these things get ahead of themselves and then there's the inevitable big uh, give back. In terms of where to focus, um, and it's probably a large part of our process, we focus on where I can actually tangibly touch and feel the earnings and have some confidence in terms of the duration of those earnings. Mm-hmm. So that's why you know we had been in stocks like you know, NVIDIA. There's ASML that does the advanced lithography for the designing the chips, which yep. is a phenomenal business. Cadence, which is the software used to design chips. And these, the, the second two that I talk about, ASML and Cadence, they aren't AI companies. It's more that AI is a little bit of an augmentation to their underlying long-term structural growth as opposed to being that pure driver. Mm-hmm. So it's just always an awareness in the portfolio of the exposure and the correlation to AI. Some are just flat out AI companies. If you want to have a look at a new video or an, or an SK Hynix or a Micron, others are a little bit, little bit more balanced. Okay. Bianca, anything anything else with regards to that? Otherwise, I, I've, I've gone through the questions. Is If there's anything else you want to talk about with AI, we could talk about it, but we've talked about how advisors are utilizing it. We've talked about the future. We've talked about adopters, developers, ways of being uh, accessing it. We've talked about valuations. Mm. I think we're covered. Yeah, I think that the really interesting space that will come up will be the software space, like who yep. can actually create the application on top because where it is different from the internet age is that you created this beautiful free platform for people to use. But if you want to use AI, actually getting access to the GPUs and the models does come with a cost. Mm-hmm. So that's why in the first instance it is favoring the incumbents, rolling out AI software into an existing uh, customer base like a 
like a Microsoft or like a ServiceNow, you know, Google trying to do it as well. And then in that software space, because as you were saying before, the tech is evolving so quickly that you can go from a winner to a loser and back again so quickly. So Adobe was going to be a massive winner because they've created this Firefly um, visual creative application. But then OpenAI released Sora. Yeah. Like, you know, tech string, really high definition, short videos. All of a sudden, Adobe was going to be a loser and now it's back to being a winner again. So just the pace of the evolution of the technology is why we like to focus on where we can actually touch and feel and see the earnings inflections because that's where we feel there is much more of a basis in terms of where the share price has gone and a bit more comfort around valuation. There you go. And what you mentioned about diversification is spot on because AI disruption is not going to affect the 10-year yield overnight. Well, it might do, I suppose, if you want to be that guy, but there you are. Nice work. Thank you very much. Uh, Until AI figures out a way to, to get a guy wearing a tie and a blue suit, to read bits and pieces off a piece of paper. I think I'm still good for this part-time gig. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sean Sumble, for uh, for letting me come in here and do this as well. You have been joined. I don't know what I'm saying sometimes. I'm just, Thank you very much, Trend Masters, Global Portfolio Manager, Alfinity Investor Management, and Bianca Rose of Morningstar Portfolio Manager over there. It's been amazing. I am – <laughs> my name is James Whelan, uh, Portfolio – I'm not Portfolio Manager, Managing Director of Barclay Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Team. And, uh, and I thank you for joining us on this Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.